What's this week's question, Thad? This week's question I found on a, a forum where people were having a dialogue about Marxism, and and I believe they were talking about Marxism specifically, but I, I think this person also had read further than that, and because it sounds like he was addressing state and revolution, but Lenin references Marx a lot. That's right. In that. Um, so this is a little polemic in a way, I think, but... Uh, I thought it would be an interesting starting point for a conversation to continue talking about state revolution. Uh, this fellow says, how could communism possibly exist or come about without a monolithic government to force it on people? And how is the state supposed to eventually just wither away? This would have to presume that humans are just, quote, clay without an essential nature, unquote. And he, he puts in parentheses here that he's heard a Marxist professor say that phrase personally. People are just clay without essential nature. Um, and he also says that we would have to deny natural economic laws with this theory. So what do you guys think? I love this question because I feel like it's full of so many little assumptions and... Uh, and premises that I think need to be picked apart to really understand where the asker is coming from and, and what our response to it will be. Maybe a good place to start is with human nature, because I think a lot of the question revolves around that. Because the speaker or the, the, the question writer's stance is that there is an undeniable human nature and Marxists are denying that. Not only human nature, but also that there are iron economic laws, which Marxists are ignoring, which I'm, I'm not going to say that there aren't iron economic laws, but I have the feeling that what he thinks are iron laws are not the same that I think, which are iron laws. I will say, I don't know if you can say that in general there are such a thing as iron economic laws, but you can say under a given society with the, uh, economic system and apparatus that exists there are given laws within that society and how its economy functions that's what i would say i don't think that there's any i don't know if you could say that there's just universally a given economic law uh what i thought was interesting about what you're talking about is that he he called them natural economic laws too um that they're not man-made they are the way things should be and that that i think plays in what what you're saying is that um, they, the, the way people set things up, they want capitalism to seem like it's natural progression, it's natural order of things, it's what humans would do, um, if they were just let loose anytime, any place, mm -hmm. any planet, uh, and so I think that that's an important distinction to make. Yeah, I think what is a potential downfall in the miscommunication here is that if you talk to people that support capitalism, and then you talk to a Marxist, the definitions of capitalism they use are v actually quite different. Um, for example, someone who supports capitalism says that anything that you do, like if a person being industrious, doing work, often meets their definition of uh, capitalism. So if, if I were to have my own self-employed business and then trade the fruits of my business with my neighbors, that would count as capitalism, whereas in Marx's from a Marxist point of view, that's not what we mean when we say capitalism. Uh, that's actually a completely different mode of production. Capitalism is a particular economic relationship between a, an employer who owns the means of production and an employee who does not own the means of production and must sell his labor in order to, to receive a part of the social product. Yeah. So I, I feel like that's part of the that's part of where the miscommunication comes in because pro capitalists want to define capitalism in such a way that it is something that has existed throughout all of history like something as broad as humans doing work which yeah humans have always had to do something in order to produce the the means of survival whether it be as simple as hunting and gathering for food like um the older as Marx points out, uh, Capital Volume 1, the older sort of cliche that the political economists would use is Robinson Crusoe and his 
island or does everything exactly like a capitalist would, even though it's completely out of nature, to sit down and be like, well, these are the resources I have, and how much can my production be like this instead of just trying to survive? <laughs> I, I feel like, and I... Like I've mentioned before, I don't know crap about crap. But I feel like oftentimes capitalism um, is in general equated with just commerce in the sense like if you bartered with someone, you're you're partaking in capitalism. But that's not... You could barter with someone and everyone could get the value of their labor. No one would be exploited. Like that kind of thing can still exist. So I feel like that's that's a huge gulf people have to jump when they start thinking about socialism and and terms that are fair to socialism they have to realize that yet there would still be ways to get what you didn't make you you would still be able to purchase things or obtain things that you didn't make i feel like everyone thinks that they would live in a commune i don't think everyone thinks that i feel like that is a common misconception though that that hinders people from even uh wanting to talk about socialism another part of the question that i want to get back to is the concept of human nature and what a human nature is. To me, it's very interesting that the question writer has specifically noted that he's heard Marxists say that humans are nothing but a blank slate, or what he... something about clay. Clay without an essential nature. Yeah, clay without an essential nature. And I'm sure that there are some Marxists that believe that, but it's very interesting to me that he assumes that that is the standard Marxist stance, because that's not what Marx believed. And when you look at especially the really early Marxist writings, the philosophic and economic manuscripts, Marx writes a lot about something that he calls species being, which it's an awkward phrase in English, but essentially I think what he's talking about is human nature. And his argument, this is going to be a, a clumsy summary of it, we could probably have a whole episode just on human nature, but Marx's uh, conclusion, which is in his early writings, so some people want to split that and, and jettison that from the canon, but his conclusion is that humans work. That's part. first part of human nature is that humans work unlike any other uh, animal because they plan out their work, they can evaluate it and change what they do and come up with new work and build upon old work. But that is what humans do, and that humans are most themselves, that they are fulfilling their human nature or species being when they choose their own work and have their own self-guided work. Whether it's self-guided because you're an individual or self-guided because you're a group all agreeing to do the same thing, that is humans fulfilling human nature. And so that you can see how that fits really well in into Marxist ideas of, of what makes a moral economy. You know, that if you're, for example, a slave, you are fulfilling, you are doing work, but it's not self-guided in any form. That work is controlled by another person. Same thing if you're an employee. Um, your work is largely guided by your employer. And, 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 and I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I don't study human nature or, or what, uh, you know, I don't get into the science behind it. But as far as just what makes people happy, like there are lots of common day, uh, management techniques now that, uh, suggest to capitalists that are interested in running a capitalist business successfully that the way you have happy, productive workers is to give them some control over the production process. So if, if human happiness is an indication of human nature, then, then that holds some water. And, and maybe human happiness is not an indication of human nature. I don't know. But it's, it's a difficult thing to define because really human nature is a term without an agreed-upon definition, and the only thing to argue over is the definition, to a certain extent. And I think it's interesting, too, with the way he, or she, uh, the person who wrote it, I guess, I don't know if it's a male or female, obviously, Um, but they have the underlying assumption that it is contrary to human nature to want something like communism or to work together, which I, or in my mind, that means to work together. But, you know, a, a society... 
Well, it's assuming that they, you know, the question they have, they have somewhat of an idea of what more Marx meant by communism. But I think that really does a lot with buying into the sort of individualism. I'm going to assume the person's American. This, this sort of individualism of America or just sort of the neoliberalism where it's, you know, what Margaret Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society. You know, that's just nonsense. I mean, there's a reason... I think I've said this before. There's a reason we live in cities and not all uh, by ourselves in caves murdering anyone who comes near. It's it, humans as human nature gathered. Well, I mean, for procreation, it's necessary to get together, at least in couples um, initially. But, you know, gathered in tribes and the tribes consolidate into, into bigger tribes and then clans and then cities and countries and, you know, world like it's. I would say that it's pretty obvious with human nature that working together is human nature, that to everybody pitch in and better ourselves. I mean, that's been the whole arc of human progress is, you know, we've made things better. We've uh, specialized in certain tasks so that I don't have to spend part of my day gathering food and gathering water and then finding shelter. It's somebody helps provide the food for me. Somebody helps provide the water for me. I provide other services to other people. And we mediate them in a capital society through the exchange of money, all these things. But, I mean, it's the whole point of society. So I think that their assumption about human nature not being so resistant as to need to be forced into communism, yeah. I think is just very off-base and really... Well, well, something that I've always thought was interesting is that when you... We talk about... Yeah, from an evolutionary perspective, we absolutely would not have gotten to a place we are without cooperation in many different forms. Um, but they talk about the modern-day idea that competition is what really leads us to excel with each other, and it's a very capitalist idea, of course, uh, that you need people to compete to be motivated, to work hard. And what I've noticed is that competition can be a strong motivating factor but a couple things it does, it stresses you out a lot more, and in some ways you might produce uh, or behave worse than you would, but it also is very um, reflexive. You need, when you're com competing, you're usually, the, the person you're benefiting most is yourself um, it, when you're going to compete, as opposed to when you cooperate, you have the mindset that you are, you're benefiting the per people you're cooperating, you're benefiting uh, yourself as well, you're benefiting people you might not even know um, but that are part of your community. And I think competition makes people much more individualistic and antagonistic, um, even though in the short term I think it can be a very, very powerful motivator. There's a really good work about competition. This It's a book called No Contest. Author is Alfie Cohn. And he goes through and studies. Uh, it's a, it's a meta-analysis, so he looks at just stu study after study after study of uh, the effects of competition versus working individually versus cooperation, because there are all three completely different things. And he finds that everyone believes, or largely it's assumed, that competition is, is pretty good. And he started the study assuming that competition would be pretty good, but that, the, but that there would be some drawbacks. And he was kind of curious like what those drawbacks might be that we're not aware of. And as he does this meta-analysis, he finds that the benefits that we believe are there are largely not there, or that they are just as strong in, in the other methods. One of the big findings that he has is that competition is, is most effective when it's a rudimentary, simple task that requires no creativity, no abstract thinking. If it is it, you know, this is why it, you know, it may function well in uh, certain sports. Like if you're just doing a foot race, if you just go run faster than the other person, competition can actually be helpful to make you run faster than you otherwise would have. But if you are trying to um, design a piece of software or uh, build a house, like anything where you need to think about it and and work and and be creative in any way or think abstractly in any way competition actually produces a, a stress on you which i think is the same word that you use stress and that stress actually restricts you from taking chances to be creative to think creatively people are at their most conservative least interesting least inventive when they 
are under competition. One good example of this, I remember this one, was a study about collages. Uh, a bunch of people were put in two different rooms, and one with the same materials, they were both instructed, you're all going to make collages. And one group was told, uh, make really interesting, make really good collages, and whoever makes the best one is going to get a prize. And the other group was told, make really interesting, really artistic collages. Yeah. End, end of no story. No competition, yeah. And then they took all of the collages, mixed them up, and handed them to a panel of professional, like, art judges or art critics. And all of the ones the art critics picked out as the best were all from the non-competitive group. The c- group that was just told, be creative, make a good collage. Uh, rather than uh, being told, and the best one will make a prize. That If you were told... The best one gets a prize. If you knew that up front, your collage that you made wasn't as interesting, wasn't as creative, wasn't as artistic as, as the other ones. And, it, and it's not just a thing for art. I mean, that example happens to be for art, but anything where you need to think abstractly or or um, or be um, creative in any way, something that involves advanced thinking. Yeah, and that too jumps me to what you were saying that the social Darwinism sort of argument that uh, gets made under capitalism a lot. And I think that that's, um, maybe I should explain what social Darwinism is in case people don't know. It's applying Darwin's, you know, survival of the fittest evolutionary model to uh, society. It's, you know, the the most fit people are the ones who rise to the top of society, the ones who, you know, wed supermodels or I don't know what they all apply it to. Who are rich, too. Yeah, who are rich. Um, but I think that's... Also, a fundamental mis... I think people like it because it's just sort of a misunderstanding of evolution, which is very poorly uh, understood in general, it seems. But it's not that... You know, with evolution, it's the the genetic quirks that happen to give you a slight advantage over time become the more dominant ones, and that's what gears the uh, species... But they're taking away the the whole species aspect of it and applying it to individuals. Right. I guess this is sort of redundant on what I said before. Um, but, you know, it's just that it's... Yeah, when you're looking at evolution, you're not looking at one single little tadpole and how that goes. Or you might be, but that's not going to give you an analysis of it. You look at the species of frog or whatever it is as a whole to see how it all gets directed like that. Whereas with social Darwinism, it ignores the totality for the individual. One of my favorite things about the particular question that you read, Thad, is that the, it starts off by asking, doesn't there need to be a strong enforcement mechanism for communism? And, and that leads me to um, address the fact that sometimes when people ask that question, they're asking it with the assumption that there is no enforcement mechanism for capitalism, that that capitalism is is the natural way mm-hmm. that humans interact if there is no intervention, which is completely false. It's easy to feel like that today because we're used to it. That's what we were grown up in. That's what everyone who raised us was grown up in and lived their entire lives in. There's very few counterexamples in the modern world today. So our our interactions are mediated by it. It's hard for a fish to notice water, as the saying goes. Yeah. But to to give a really simple example, if a bunch of employees all walked into the workplace uh, Monday morning and said, "We own this now," and the employer doesn't own it, and and the the major stockholders don't own it, we own this now because uh, this this is ours. Though the law would not respect that, and they would they would be forced to relinquish any uh, profits or whatever that they gained by doing that, or probably they wouldn't even get them at the first place. But all of society is built around that, and and if if it became really serious, the you know we may the the state may intervene with armed men in order to enforce that distinction, and that's fine that's okay i guess but you got to realize that what that is is an enforcement of a particular social structure 
that that is enforcing the capitalist social structure and any challenge to that structure will will be shot down in courts and or physically repressed if it need come to that level so uh i think we got to recognize that capitalism has that structure and in fact if yeah. we go back historically this is one thing that marx didn't didn't talk about very much or may may not have known is that early capitalism when it came into a when when capitalism was introduced in most places it was not the the standard story that sometimes you hear that a bunch of people started their own home business and then some people started working for other people and then there became larger businesses in a lot of places the way capitalism started was you had just tracks and tracks of of land where self-sufficient peasants were living after a monarchy toppled oftentimes or or if maybe it's a pre-feudal society and there was no monarchy and you just had self-sufficient peasants living places so people that would farm the land and make all the stuff they needed and live on their own you know completely uh not a capitalist structure using the marxist definition there were not employers and employees there was just self-sufficient people and then capitalists would come in and open up a mine or a factory or whatever and try to employ the local people and they couldn't do it because the local people were happy doing what they were doing. They liked doing what they were doing and even though they could get money from uh this other employment opportunity, they didn't care about money because they didn't need money for anything because everything they needed they made on their own. So the way capitalism came about was the introduction of taxes. Okay. Which is really interesting because, you know, people on the on the right side of the spectrum are usually the ones that like to complain about taxes. But taxation was how capitalism came into effect in the majority of the world. And and it was that the usually an invading government would impose a tax on something, like a simple land tax, say. And all of these peasants that lived on their own land would be forced to pay a land tax, and they needed to pay it with the currency of that government, whatever the official currency was. And how did you get that currency? By working for either that government or by a, a capitalist business that that was essentially part of the same society as that right. government. And so it, it, a lot of times it, it split. It would be like in the non-growing season, you would work a little bit to pay your taxes. But that's how that's how capitalism got its foothold and got started yeah. in most places. Doesn't sound very natural to me. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a really good example of how, well, capitalism seems natural to us and, and, it, and in many ways has been naturalized by us as yeah. we've lived our lives. That hasn't always been the case, and and yeah. that people have resisted it, but you know, fighting tooth and nail to try to hold on to their previous way of life. Yeah, this ties into the state and revolution too. What he was saying, um, uh, what you remarked upon, talking about, don't we need a monolithic government force to do this? And it's interesting because it's kind of the opposite. Uh, the state and revolution. Lenin talks about this government. The purpose of it is that we have an inequality where uh, uh, most of the people have little, and there's a massive amount of wealth in the hands of very few and to to ban to keep that um lack of balance uh, in place you need to have a strong force and like that's what you're mentioning the workers could not come into a factory and say we own this now because you'd have that force um and i think what it, what is missed there and what lenin says right is that once you don't have that inequality, that imbalance, you actually have a much more natural homeostasis when everyone owns everything. When they own the the means of production and everyone shares in that and shares in that the value of their labor, um, then you don't need that force. And perhaps you need a strong force to make that change. You need a catalyst for that chemical reaction, but afterwards you have that homeostasis and and that's an interesting uh, the question has so many embedded presuppositions which i think are, are great for you guys to address mm -hmm. um and and a lot of it does come about because we live in this world like you said it's naturalized it's such a powerful weapon this naturalization where you think that this is the way things should be and it's real difficult to even start thinking about how, how it could be different when when you take it for granted that that's how things should be mm -hmm. yeah and, and this might be a comment that other Marxists will disagree with me on, and that's okay. 
but my, my understanding of the Soviet Union is that it was indeed still a class society, a class society very different from the, the capitalist society that we live in here in America today, because the differences in wealth weren't as great, and, and th the structure was also different. But I think when we look at violence in the Soviet Union to maintain that system, to me, that is, that helps make the case that what you had there was still a class society, one of, of state bureaucrats and, and workers, which mimicked in many ways the the employer-employee relationship. It was different in significant ways, but in many ways it mimicked it. And I think that's part of where the question comes from, with, with this assumption that this, the Soviet Union was the the quintessential socialist state, that, that that's um, what it, what socialists believe in and fight for everywhere. And and don't get me wrong, maybe we should do an episode, because we bash the Soviet Union a lot on here, <laughs> maybe we should do an episode on on the accomplishments of the Soviet Union sometime too. Because oh, yeah. there are a bunch of accomplishments that I'm glossing over for, for the purpose of this uh, particular point. But Yeah, no, and Thad, I think you hit the nail on the head as to my understanding of the withering away of the state is, yeah, exactly, that once you get to that level, you no longer need... Because Lenin, for Lenin, the state is the tool of repression, as you said. Um, and it's once you get to the point where, yeah, you get to a homeostasis, I believe, is the phrase you, or term you used, that, yeah, you no longer need the state there as a tool of oppression. And I also think a lot of people get that confused with uh, anarchy. Like, there is no government then. Everybody's just free to do whatever. And I mean, I think uh, it remains to hit a society where you have the option to have that discussion. But I personally think, you know, you'll still need some form of government if, to facilitate the exchange of uh, goods that are collectively produced, if nothing else. But yeah, I think that's that's really truly what Lenin's getting at with the withering away of the state is the withering away of the necessity of the course of state that forces things upon people. Right. This mm -hmm. is putting the cart far before the horse, but when I imagine it getting this far after like a revolution and we're getting to the point where things start to wither away, I would still imagine there need to be some sort of infrastructure in place for the exchange, not only goods and services or things like that, but um, also the exchange of ideas and see what people are doing around the country. Because you still, in a sense, if, if it was all, say, America that's doing this, and, and it would probably have to be the whole world, I would say. But if it's just America, uh, people would be able to, to vote on all these things. But you'd probably want larger issues addressed, too. And you'd need something in place, some some forum for that. And even... Mm -hmm. It'd be pretty cool if government became just a facilitator of um, dialogue and and voting, uh, but yeah, I, it feels like there'd need to be something in place like that. And and because in that you'd still have to have rules, you know, you so people could not take advantage of it too. Uh, Murder's like, not okay suddenly. Yeah, well, yeah, you definitely still have laws, but yeah, even in you you want somebody overseeing that things are are voted on legitimately and and that discourse is not corrupted in some way. Uh, so yeah. Yep. When reading State and Revolution, there are a couple of phrases in the book that make it sound like Lenin believes that all violence will be abolished uh, in in a communist society, which I think is may, you know maybe it's an understand misunderstanding on my part of what he means by that, but I think it's an overstatement if if he means what I think that that there will simply be no violence at all. Like, for example, there, there may be people who are, are not healthy and want to murder someone for some reason. You know, that's something that we'll need to manage and, and restrict that person from doing that, just to stop them. Motivation um, for violence is very often economic-based in our country, uh, monetary-based, but there's a lot of other reasons that people commit those kinds of crimes, too. Yeah, exactly. Serial killers existed before and after capitalism. Yeah, crime of passion, like uh, relationships. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Like, Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's a good argument to be made that there will be far less violence because of the, sure. the yeah. class structure of violence and the, and the economic creators of violence. But I don't think that we can say it'll be wiped out entirely. And I, I would go as far to say as that there would need to be laws that would invoke force if needed to maintain the the mode of production that we have agreed on, a, a mode of production without exploitation. But for example, and we have this in, in, in the U.S. now to a certain extent, like 
if someone was found to be harboring slaves to do their production process, that would be recognized as illegal and, and if necessary, force would be used to stop that person from maintaining slaves and the slaves would be free. And that, that's a s situation where an economic system has outlawed a different economic system. We, you know, our society is a capitalist society. We've decided we're not a slave society, so we've outlawed this other form of production. And if it happens, we're going to go in there and break it up so it can't be there. And, you know, if for some reason, you know, maybe it would be very, very rare, and I hope that it would be, but if for some reason there were people trying to uh, reinstate capitalism or try to have capitalism without anyone knowing that 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 would have to be not allowed to say, look, what you're doing here is setting up a class structure and, and you know, where this person is gaining from, you know, is appropriating the surplus produced by these other people. You're not allowed to do this. You need to, you know, restructure this this whole operation or or dissolve it. Would there be police? Would that still, would there be a police department? I think there would need to be. I mean, other people might disagree with me on this, but I think there would need to be. Because, like you said, yeah, if, like, if someone, well, someone's spouse cheated on them and they were angry enough that they were going to harm them, you know, the, there would need to be a way to, yeah. to, you know, to provide protection for those people. It seems to me that the qualms we have in modern day society with our police, um, that we don't have as much control, that they're the man. I mean, I, we, even though people don't address it on um, uh, socialist versus capitalist terms, people treat police as the man because I, I think there is an a, a implicit feeling that they do represent um, a repressive force, right? Like oh, yeah. they, they do this. So that wouldn't be part of the stigma of being a police officer. You'd also probably have more of a voice in how um, uh, the the rules that police have to follow, um, their protocol, who who is a police officer. I mean, I think that's that's a really thing, a uh, big thing I want to emphasize. Ham hammer home is that you would have more of a say. You'd be more plugged in to the circuitry of your community in socialism in a way that we don't even. I'm so disillusioned because I don't feel like I could uh, affect any change, even at a very local level. I feel like maybe I could do some very small things if I dedicate a lot of time. But in this model, you could do, you could have a voice in a way that people just don't get right now, which is really cool. Yeah, the police are, I mean, it's part of the executive branch, which is to be the executors of the laws. Mm -hmm. And the laws are set up to maintain our class structure. So, yeah, it's not surprising that people call them the man because they're the enforcers of capitalism. And if the laws that they were enforcing were, were much different and supported you and, and you had a voice in them, you'd probably feel differently. Oh, yeah. It's just that, yeah, the way everything's set up now is it's antagonistic. The majority of the pop yeah. vast majority of the population, thus the police force, is antagonistic to the vast majority of the population and increasingly so with the worse off you are in popula the population as far as socioeconomic status goes. You know, yeah. that's the, the uh, minorities and poor people get it the worse off because our system is set off that they are the worst off. Therefore, they're at the most brutal end of the, uh, the policing because that's where they need to maintain the most control because that's where the most likely people who uh, will be... Yeah. Who are disenfranchised and will be disillusioned with the society and wanting to do something about it. it and and they also are part of, or represent in a way, um, our judicial society too. Uh, the, how unfair things are in courts as well. The, our justice system in general does this. It, whether the, what the cops do is one thing, but they also, people know that minorities and poor people uh, get the S end of the stick much more often as when it comes to... Uh, to sentencing and things like that. Oh, yeah. Can we jump back really quick to what we t what you talked about earlier with uh, people being clay without an essential nature? Yeah. Um, because what that 
it, I'll take it at face value that a Marxist professor did say that. Yeah. Um, because it makes sense to me. And what, what rang in my head was one of the few things I do know about Marx was that he was a materialist. Um, and, and my understanding of what that means is that he says that the environment a person's in shapes their thoughts. Um, and the opposite of that would be an idealist, I think, who says that, um, that the environment we're in doesn't shape our thoughts. You, in fact, you can, the way you shape your thoughts can change how you feel, how you act. It can actually have more of an influence on the environment than vice versa in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that might be sort of a hyperbolic extension, what that professor said, of that materialist idea, because they're saying, in a way, if you really do pu believe purely in materialism with no caveats, that would be that. You are just this, this unmolded clay, depending on the forces around you, that's what you become. And so that's, what do you guys think about that? Because that's what um, I heard in my head when I heard that quote. I agree that it is a hyperbole. I feel like it is a misunderstanding. It, it's taking what is a seed of truth, which is, and, th and I would call the seed of truth this, that capitalist society or any current society, that almost every society tries to portray itself as the thing that always has been and always will be. You know, feudalism did the same thing. Uh. Slavery, I'm sure, did the same. Capitalism has done the same. Every single one of them has tried to do that. And so the Marxist recognition is that's not true. That all of these things that have been said to be eternal are, are not. They are historically conditioned. Now, I think the mistake is therefore to say that therefore everything is, histo is, is purely that and that there is nothing else. To me, being a materialist means understanding the genetic makeup of a species, you know, to, to say that it, it is part of our, our genetic code to do things like develop a creative language where, where new words can be created. Almost every human that, that has lived with other humans has done that in some way. You know, the, the, the stories about, um, the first few schools for deaf kids where they created their own sign language when that was first created. It was, you know, an explosion of language when you put these people together that otherwise couldn't communicate with people around them. Mm -hmm. It's just something hardwired in humans. And, and someone might not agree with me on that, but, you know, from what I understand, uh, from what I've read, language is one of those things that we do. And I feel like that fits so well into the idea of creative work as well. It, it's, it's being, you know, trying something different, deciding what you're going to do, planning it out, and, and building upon it, um, in it throughout your life and in the, into the next generation to take the, the fruits of the labor from the old one, what's already been established, and build upon those. I think those are extremely specific to humans and, and that it is part of, of therefore our nature. But that's, that's materialist, you know? What, what's nature besides your genetic code when you get down to it? You know, and, and that's material. So I don't think it's, it's not being materialist, but I think it is taking one particular observation and then saying, therefore, that, that is the only way that everything works. Mm -hmm. Did we answer the question? <laughs> well, I, I feel like we, we, we did in a couple different ways, but if you guys, so, the first part was how could communism or socialism exist without the monolithic government force to instate it. And, and that is, that's interesting because he, he says not to keep it going, but to force it on people. It was, was his exact wording. So I guess, um, you know, you could talk about that, that what a revolution would look like there. Cause there is a force that's necessary. Um, it doesn't need to be monolithic and governmental because, in, it, because, when you have the majority of the people working together, it doesn't need to be a government in that sense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So uh, I would say my answer is, yeah, there's going to be a force. But to me, what that force looks like is we find out that somebody is running a sweatshop somewhere and we shut it down. So you can't do that. You, you know, the every, everyone involved in a business enterprise must be equals uh, or, or right. at least... Uh, equal to a certain degree in order to to make this work, and, or, or the same thing if we found that somebody was was uh, establishing a slave economic system within uh, a socialist society. Yeah, there's got to be some force that can step in and say you can't have slaves. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, and, and breaks that up and, and, and makes sure that, that people are being treated equitably, like, the, to make sure that the people are being treated, quote unquote, like human beings who sure. freely part, you know, to, to tap into that whole species being thing again. Yeah. To say that people are being treated in a way that allows them to participate in the direction of their own labor. I, I think part of the naturalization of capitalism is, and government in general, um, is to say that any change is chaos. Anything that's not what we have set up right now will just be chaotic and it will not work. And, uh, and so I think that it, it, it's, this question is going down that road a little bit. Like, how could it possibly work without what we have right now? Uh, and in fact, it works that way now and would work differently later. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting inverse of the question. <laughs> and then the second part was the, how, is the state supposed to eventually just wither away? And that's what he tied to human nature and national economic laws being in the way of that. Mm -hmm. And I think we addressed that a little bit. I don't know if you guys want to say more about it. I, w I would only say, I, I think we're getting close to this, but I'm not sure I said it out loud. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I would add to it is that the Marxist writings that are about the state withering away use a particular definition of the state that I don't think that we generally use, at least not us in conversation and most people today. When you read State and Revolution by Lenin, his definition of the state, that it, and he defines it right away up front, is a state is organized force to enforce a class society. It is uh, police and army that are there to make sure that the ruling class stays in power and that the working class uh, plays their role. And that is precisely what what socialists want to abolish. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that there is no class division, that everyone is essentially in the same cooperative class, and people aren't controlling vast seas of other people's labor, that, that people are participating equally in the direction of their labor. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean, however, that we there, there will be a withering way of education systems of uh, the post office, for example, in our society, the government organized healthcare in other societies. That doesn't mean that all of those things will necessarily go away. You know, a socialist society will need people to organize on a large scale the things that are needed on a large scale. Um, I'm going to jump in here and say, popped in my head when you're talking about the withering away of that stuff. Actually... The withering away of the essential state functions is what you're seeing now as a project of the capitalist Republicans. <laughs> it's the withering away of the state like people are accusing, or like this person is sounding like they're accusing uh, socialism or communism of doing. Uh, you know, it's, it's that stuff that they're worried about is precisely happening. It's what the Republicans are, or the, especially the Tea Party Republicans are working towards, is the getting rid of the state as providing functions other than repression. Right. So it's, it's yes. ironic in that way. Yeah. This is just a side note because we had another question about democracy, but that really ties into Zizek, and I think other people said this too, I think David Harvey as well, that uh, capitalism and democracy are not in, inexorably linked together, and in fact, they're antagonistic to each other. But I think save that discussion for when we specifically address that. All right, I totally want to pull in this quote that I had selected earlier, because I, I think it really builds on what you were saying about the Republicans dismantling one part of the state while enforcing another. This is actually Engels. Uh, I'm reading it out of State and Revolution. Lenin quotes Engels a lot. The state is nothing more than a machine for the oppression of one class by another, and indeed in the democratic republic no less than in the monarchy. So both in a monarchy situation and in a republic or, or a democratic republic, the state is still there to enforce class divisions. Mm -hmm. And at best an evil inherited by the proletariat after its victorious struggle for class supremacy, whose worst sides, so the worst sides of the state, the proletariat, just like the commune, will have at the earliest possible moment to lop off. Which I love. So he's saying, although he defines state as the, the oppression of one class by another, I, I feel like in the second half of the quote, he morphs into a larger definition of the state with all of its functions and says, when we have a socialist society, 
the first order of business will be to identify the most repressive parts of that state and to lop them off, which is precisely what the Republicans are doing, but in reverse, where they have found the most progressive parts of the state, the most forward-thinking, the most cooperative parts of the state, trying their hardest and sometimes succeeding to lop them off. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.